What's going on, y'all? Have you ever wanted to work with a superstar? Well, today's guest, Camille Barbone, has worked with one of the biggest superstars in the history of the music industry. She discovered, developed, and managed superstar Madonna. Camille has such an amazing story, and this is such a fun episode. She has worked with major labels. Her first job was with Columbia Records, which is now owned by Universal Music Group. And she was the manager of new release coordination, meaning she worked with the 28 different departments, every single department of the record label, and learned all sides of the labels. She's also worked for former major uh, Polygram Records, which is now owned by Universal Music Group. And she was always inspired with artist management, right? Because artist managers are the ones that have all the power behind an artist's career and really touch every area of the music industry. So she started her own studio, Gotham Records, in New York City, where she met Madonna. And in this episode, we have so many fantastic stories, such so many great lessons. I'm really excited to share this with all you guys. Before we get to the interview, please take a quick second to subscribe to the podcast right down here. Just hit the subscribe button and uh, leave a comment. Any questions or anything, I'd love to answer questions for you guys in the comments. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. And I hope you enjoy this episode with the amazing Camille Barbone. Live the life you love. So I want to start with a little different Um I like taking risks with the podcast sometimes. So I'm going to start with a a list of things we have in common. Um, And of course, you have way more experience in in those things than than I do. But uh, I noticed we're both living in Florida, which is is cool. I was in St. Pete. So I actually almost moved to uh, work at the Mahaffey over there. Ah. And then we we both teach. I have a passion for teaching, which is awesome. And then we both have a degree in psychology. Yep, we do. It's a lot. That's a lot of common ground there. Yeah. Moved to Florida about uh, three years ago. We still have a place in New York, uh, but the weather is the weather, and I'm blessed with the ability to do what I do wherever I want to do. So, you know, if I want to do it on the back of a, you know, 40, 40 foot sailboat, I can do it. I'm <laughs> really blessed that way. And, you know, we have a, we have a really nice place near St. Petersburg, and it's really, it's a, what I love about St. Petersburg is the fact that there is a, a, music scene here that's mm-hmm. just starting to grow and and bubble and it reminds me of the old days in new york you know mm-hmm. when you could go down to the village and there were 20 places where you could play live yeah the, in the main cities the music centers there aren't any places to play live anymore right for, yeah. for up and comers you know and st petersburg has fanzines they have you know they still have record stores with vinyl it's mm-hmm. pretty exciting and and there are a couple of really good recording studios too so i'm a happy camper here you know? that's awesome yeah st pete's a really cool place i, I love it that's it is probably where, is, I, where i want to end up one day as far as teaching it's my passion um it's it's what i love to do you know i i, I feel obligated as as far as passing on my knowledge and doing service uh, and as far as a de- degree in, in psychology, I thought I needed that working in the music business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I figured it would be a really good thing to understand how these minds work. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know? And then later on, I went on to get an MBA. Uh, so I figured between the two, I was it was pretty well equipped for anything that might come my way. Absolutely, you are. Yeah. So you're a really interesting person, way beyond even the music business, and. During the whole COVID-19 thing, I really got into cooking and my, my wife and I eat these beautiful gourmet meals now every night and don't even want to go to a restaurant anymore. So one of my favorite managers in the music business is Chef Gordon, who went to culinary school to, because he had a passion for the art of cooking, but he also threw these amazing parties and just had a passion for cooking for people. And you also went to culinary school, to the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, what inspired you to become a chef? Well, you know, I have to tell you, it, it, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, I, was, I was in the throes of just beginning the lawsuit between Madonna and myself. Mm-hmm. And it, I was in complete, I, like, I really needed to get away from the business a little bit. So I decided I would, I would think about maybe changing careers, which is a joke. I, you know, <laughs> here I am 30 years later. But um, I thought it would be a really wonderful thing to uh, learn how to cook. I love to cook. I was a really good cook, but I always admired the chefs and, and, and the real cooks, you know, mm-hmm. Jacques Pepin and all those kind of people. Yeah. You know, Julia Child, she was, she was a hoot to watch all the time. Mm-hmm. 
So I, instead of running away to join the circus, I <laughs> ran away and went to CIA in, in Hyde Park and went through the entire course and actually interned and worked in the music, in, in the restaurant business and thought I was going to like forego the music business. And it's a great story. Uh, one evening, all the, all the servers come running in and go, they go, Mick Jagger and Brian Ferry are upstairs eating. And it hit me, you know, because it was like, you're down here cooking for them. You're, you're supposed to be up there sitting in the table talking to them. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was just kind of, I, I was a little sour with the, with having to go through the lawsuit. And eventually we settled. Uh, but it was just that, you know, and my family had like this weird idea that I was going to take over all their restaurants too. <laughs> for a restaurant, and that never happened. But it, it, it's very much like music for me cooking, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of the combination. Like when Absolutely. I go to a studio, it's the same kind of thing in terms mm -hmm. of the mix, in terms of the blend, Absolutely. balance and all. The and I love flavors it. And seasonings, yeah. So like your wife is benefiting from the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> My family benefits from the fact that I'm a damn good cook. That's <laughs> so awesome. It I all worked it. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, the, the real estate th um, stuff you're involved in, because I always talk to musicians about trying to create other revenue streams because uh -huh. one of the struggles a lot of starting musicians have is money uh, not having enough money and that's why they're chasing labels and investors and all that and you do real estate coaching um like what i guess tell me a little bit more about that and what kind of coaching you do for real estate and do you dive into investing at all you know whether you're selling yourself musically or you're selling a, you know a two million dollar one bedroom apartment in new york <laughs> uh you're still selling Right. You know, and I think that's what, when I work with my, my, my real estate folks, it's about not procrastinating, being a self-starter, self-discipline in terms of all the DIY things you have to do as a realtor, mm -hmm. um, follow through, making sure all of the agreements are correct. It's, it's, it runs completely parallel to what I tell artists mm -hmm. starting their careers and even afterwards. Um, you, you need to understand the mechanisms of your business in order to do it right. right. And there's a lot of, when you're selling yourself, there's a lot of parallels. Mm -hmm. So we, we work about, we work on things like, okay, I have a meeting with a, you know, with a huge business developer, a, a building developer. And I go, okay, how are you preparing for that meeting? Well, I'm going to wear this and I'm going to wear my hair like this. And I said, no, no, who are you sitting down and talking to? You need to understand what this person has done, the last big deal he or she did. And that's really what I tell artists too when they're gonna sit down and maybe interview a manager or, or have a conversation with a club owner. Mm -hmm. Understand who these people are. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to give you such a, such a leg up with regards to connection, with mm -hmm. regards to ultimately getting what you want. And that's another thing that I always, I always tell anyone that's in sales, you must understand what your objective is. Mm -hmm. prior to doing anything and then you plot your course from that that's what coaching does too right. i go okay what do you want to achieve and then we work backwards to find a uh, a plan mm -hmm. that gives the results that you want your desired results so it's very similar to that there's also another parallel i, I deal with a lot of high-end realtors mm -hmm. uh, in new york la um and and out of the country and that's even a very that's a very different uh, scenario too, um, in that you're dealing with people that have a lot of money, they have a sense of entitlement, they're a little bit fussier mm -hmm. to deal with. Uh, it's kind of like managing a big artist, yeah. you know, That's they're used to things their way. So I see so many parallels in terms of, of my experience in the music business with what goes on in other businesses. Mm -hmm. Even though our business, the music business is, is quite unique, it's mm -hmm. still a business. The only yeah. difference is our business, the music business, has living, breathing commodities. Mm -hmm. Whereas everybody yeah. else are dealing, they're dealing with intangibles or, 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 or tangibles, you know? Right. Uh, so that's a different thing. So when a, when a record company drops an artist, when, when a, you know, a record company signs an artist, not only does that artist get impacted personally, but his entire or her entire life changes. Yeah, absolutely. And the same thing holds, you know, it, it holds true with, mm -hmm. with any, any business like that when you're dealing with I, I mean I'm a I'm a living breathing commodity right. as a coach mm -hmm. and consultant you know yeah. uh, and I know what I have to do to brand myself not many people do though mm -hmm. that's so interesting because there is so many parallels between the music industry and just the business world 
my wife works for Urban Outfitters and sometimes she'll like have an issue at work and she asks me like, I guess management advice and the advice I give her, she's always like, man, you should be working at Urban Outfitters and run a store. And I always say, well, the funny thing is the outside industry doesn't understand the music industry. So when I put that, what I do on a resume, it doesn't really translate to store manager, but it really does. It's right, but it really does. Yeah, I agree completely with that. You know, especially artist management. You mm -hmm. know, I look at artist management as, as you know, you're, you're kind of the CEO of a company and yeah. the product is the artist. And mm -hmm. that, artist that artist development team that you put together, which I've done a lot of webinars on, it's really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like the departments or divisions in a corporation, mm -hmm. you know. You have to keep everybody focused. Your job as a, as a CEO for a company or a manager is to make sure that everyone's vision remains the same. Yeah. When I was a kid in the dark ages, you know, we had this <laughs> game called telephone, you know, and everybody would sit and whisper in the next person's oh, yeah. ear. And then by the end of it, you didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what goes on, yeah, you know, absolutely. in the business world, unless you have a leader, mm -hmm. you know, and some people are, beautiful leaders and other people are not so beautiful, but it's not because there's a, there's a flaw. It's just, they don't understand the mechanism of having groups of people focused on one thing and yeah. doing it in a way that brings it back to the results that everybody wants, you know, mm -hmm. so it's focus, it's understanding. Again, it's task oriented, you know, what makes someone a good leader and is it something that has to be naturally innate in them or can someone also become a better leader? I think he can become a better leader, mm -hmm. but I think there's some people that are just, you know, genetically, organically followers and prefer it. And mm -hmm. I think, I think most entrepreneurs are leaders, mm -hmm. you know, and I've been an entrepreneur all my life. So I think if you have that entrepreneurial spirit, um, you, you, you're fearless. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're willing to fail. You're willing to learn from mistakes based upon where your ego is at one point or another, you, you, you you'll take, you know, corrective criticism, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you have vision, you dare to dream. Uh, I think all of these things are leadership qualities. You have to have those. And I, I think, and this is funny, I think you also have to sound confident, even if you aren't. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is, that, is that dishonest? I don't know. I don't think so. Because I'll tell you, there have been times in my career when I first started out, I, I'd sit down in a meeting and, and I was pitching for a job or something like that. And I, I was blessed with, with this gift that makes me sound like I know what the hell I'm doing, even if I don't, you know? Yeah. And there was the very first time I was a music supervisor on a film. It was a, a film that used, at that time, it, was, it, it wasn't called EDM. It was, elect, you know, the electronic dance right. music thing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, it was rave music then. And I wanted to be a music supervisor in the worst way in a film. And, and Miramax was doing a film on music supervision. And, they, and I interviewed for it. And I did my little, you know, my little notes. And I got ready for my meeting, as is my, well, you know, I got the gig. And, and it, it was just, to, I'll date myself a little bit. I run out of the office. There's a pay telephone on the corner. <laughs> I pick up the pay telephone. And I call a friend of mine at a record label. I said, I need to know everything about dance music <laughs> you tell me everything Who, who's ahead who's happening what's going on and and that's okay because by the time i was ready to do that job i knew what i needed to do it didn't matter about the type of music it, it mattered that i understood how to be a music supervisor and how to match images with with the songs to make mm -hmm. them make sense you know so i managed to find some really great rave artists and it was a very successful movie and Christina Applegate was the lead and I can't remember James something or other was it was really fun it was a fun movie that they shot in New York you know and, and I went on to do music supervision supervision a few more times you know mm -hmm. but it's it's understanding your your strengths as mm -hmm. as a as a an entrepreneur and and if you want to assume that leadership role, I did, I always did. I mm -hmm. much prefer being a boss, <laughs> candidly. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really worked for many people in my, in my life. I've been an entrepreneur since I was about 30. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I worked at labels and I learned a lot at labels. You know, I was, I was, a, I started as a manager of new release coordination for Columbia. Mm -hmm. Sony was Columbia. Right. Uh, a, a while a while ago and it was an interesting job to get um, because it it made me responsible for understanding the mechanisms and functionality of the 28 different departments that created 
albums from mm -hmm. beginning to end. Now think about this, it has to be on time because they're putting millions of dollars in marketing into things, or there's a tour coming up, or there's a big TV show or something. So it made me understand the mechanisms, but I always enjoyed working with management the most. And I worked with the artists. I mean, they used to send me into, you know, artists' homes to get them to approve the, the, the final mixes on things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a cool. crazy, wonderful job, you know, mm -hmm. which prepared me for the rest of my career. But I think that's where I learned leadership because I had to, I had to not only uh, instill in, import on making the, uh, the, the date, I had mm -hmm. to motivate and I had to chastise as well, you know, being a, being a leader doesn't mean you're always good, you know, everything's good and everybody's like <laughs> singing and hey, we did a successful job. There's also the responsibility of shaping your team and your team doesn't always behave the way they should. <laughs> yeah. So you learn a lot, you know, yeah. and I can understand why very often corporations take people in from the military and mm, give them yeah. good jobs because they understand that chain of command. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You also have a big passion for, for giving back and teaching the next generation. You do a monthly thing at Full Sail, also at the University in, in St. Pete. Um, why is that so important to you to give back to the next generation? And what is it that you want them to learn in those master classes that you do? Well, I want them to, to, I want them to learn about the business. I think too often everybody thinks this is a big party, the music industry. Yeah. And it's one of the most difficult businesses to be in. And you've got to put, you know, major hours in. But it's not major hours partying. I think the right. first thing that, that we people have to understand is even though music, which is considered a you know leisure, you know a social event, is is that it's there's this still a multi billion dollar business here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the look at the streaming figures for the yeah. first quarter, Sony made one point seven billion dollars in streaming. That's not a mom and pop business. No. So here, here you are, you aspire to be, this. yeah, I'm going to be a manager. Yeah, I'm going to be an agent. There's a lot you need to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a, there's a, there needs to be a school for this. Yeah. And, and I, I love the fact that, that a lot of these colleges have schools like this, but, and, but they really don't delve into the artist management business side as much as they do the technical side. Right. You know, they're engineering and production and, mm -hmm. you know, studio yeah. setup and live sound and all that kind of stuff. But the business side of this is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I, um, I taught at IAR in New York, which unfortunately went under about a year ago. And it was a premier school. It started out as a school for mastering engineers. And then they did the, the heavy end on the, the studio side. And then they said, let's do a business program. So I taught artist management there. It was fabulous. I also taught artist management at Baruch College. Okay. And uh, people don't know how many different jobs you can have in the music business. Yeah, so many. You know, so many. But for the next generation, I want to see them do it morally and ethically correct. Mm -hmm. I want them to come from a knowledgeable place. I think it's really important that you understand the business. And I also think it's very important that whoever you work for and with, if you're a manager, you make sure you're instilling the information that you have onto them so that collectively, you know, we all understand how the business works. Now, on the, the other side of the coin, purely, purely human, okay, is you have to have a conscience in this business. You know, you have an opportunity um, to, to fall to temptation in this business. There's a lot of chances you have to get your hands on money that doesn't belong to you. Right. And sadly, many people fall for that. But I, you know, it's a fiduciary responsibility when you work with artists. It's, it's got to be based on trust. In all the years I, I, between me and managing Madonna, I've been interviewed about, about Madonna several times. Right. I've never once dissed her mm -hmm. because I still have a fiduciary responsibility in her to keep mm -hmm. our trust in place, to keep right. our confidentiality, confidentiality in place. What I know stays with me, you know, like what stays in Vegas, what's, you know, what's in Camille stays in Camille <laughs> yeah. as far as clients are concerned. And then there's, you know, when you, when you sign a management agreement, you actually, they sign over a power of attorney in mm -hmm. all probability because yeah. you got to sign contracts, you got to pick checks up, you got to do all this stuff. Well, that means I can go into anybody's bank account and get anything. Right. I can take property that belongs to them and switch it over to me. 
Mm -hmm. And that is something that's been done. And what I try and do is I instill in, in people coming into this business, I want them to have a higher vision. I, I, I want them to understand uh, that you can be incredibly successful in this business mm -hmm. and not rip people off. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because... Yeah, I love that because when I started in the business, I definitely seen a change. I've only been in for about uh, 13, 14 years. And when I started, um, I've seen a change since then, but I've always, always been told that I'm too nice and too honest for, for the business. Uh, and I don't, and I love that you're giving a different uh, kind of message. And I, I've had that since, I had the same thing said to me a number of times. You know how successful you've been in this music business? I go, yeah. You could have been 10 times more successful if you were a bit more of a shark. <laughs> and, you know, looking back on it, I, I can walk into any room I need to in the entertainment industry. I can run into anybody. And I'm not, a, I'm not worried about it, you right. know. And you can't say that about many people in my generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th that to me, peace of mind, you know, I close my eyes for the last time, I'm good, you know. Yeah. And, and you have to think that way. You have to say, can you live with yourself? Now, if you can live with yourself when you've done wrong things, you're a sick person. You're probably yeah. a sociopath, you know, yeah, absolutely. so next, you know, <laughs> and there are a lot of those in business, not only the music business, you yeah. know, sociopaths interview very well. So they, yeah. know, they get a lot of jobs. <laughs> you, you have a lot of experience and so many great lessons and which makes me excited that you have a book coming out. Um, tell me a little bit about your book and when can we expect to, to see that? Well, with, with the pandemic, we were scheduled for fall of, mm -hmm. of 2020. But with the pandemic, I think it's, it's probably going to be summer of 2021. Okay. That's number one. Um, the book is, is interesting. You know, I, over the years, I've had so many offers, some big money offers to do a tell-all book mm -hmm. on, you know, managing Madonna, knowing behind the scenes stuff, all that kind of stuff. And I completely passed every time. Mm -hmm. Back to that fiduciary responsibility I just talked yeah. about. But there are certain truths about my working relationship with Madonna, with Madonna that really needed to be clarified. There's a lot of urban myth running around out there and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to make some points clear that weren't clear to date. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the book is about 30% memoirs, which includes my, my working career, and it of course includes my working with Madonna. But it's 70% primer for the music industry. Back to me wanting to instill the right mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, for the next generation. And maybe for people of this generation that are open to some change and, right. and maybe haven't thought of some of the things that I've thought of over the years. So it's 70% about the music industry, but the way I've chosen to approach talking about the music industry is through a lot of stories by well-respected people in the industry. Mm -hmm. So sitting down with Linda Perry, you know, sitting down with a Joe Galante, sitting down with people like that and saying, talk to me about this. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about a catch and kill. And then what I do is I impose that into that chapter. So not only is there kind of not dry, but real uh, educational data, there's also a story to kind of hook into that drives that concept home and gives mm -hmm. better comprehension. So it's a great book. It's got great stories you know, and it's really informative. It's yeah. called Road to Vogue. I love it. <laughs> and uh, there are, in, 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 ex, in addressing the Madonna topic, there are a couple of things in there that no one knows about that I think will find, they'll find incredibly shocking, mm -hmm. not negative on Madonna at all. I want to preface that. It's not a tell-all. It's not anything like that. But in terms of how I dealt with managing an artist brought him to the brought her to the industry and then the industry light bulb goes on and says wait a minute this wait. one's going to be gigantic mm -hmm. okay he can't let this 30 year old kid manage her right. he can't happen and then the, and then you've got that core of power structure in there mm -hmm. so how do we get her from her how do we take Madonna away and that happens all the time. You know, the, right. a record company will say, um, you know, your, your uncle's managing you. He doesn't know anything about the business. It's really going to hurt you. We really want to sign you, but we got to get you a new manager. Yeah. Or the kid from the hood that you want to be managing. Right. And in a way, they're right. You have to understand the business in order to occupy that role. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
but you don't, you, you could co-manage, you could, you could right. take somebody on under your wing. And as a coach, I do that all the time. People that want to be managers. Sometimes I work with them almost as a co-manager. They're managing somebody and I'm coaching them how to manage. Mm -hmm. And it works out beautifully because they develop the skills that they need to, to bring this, this artist home, you know? Right. You know, I had 10 years of, ex of experience before I even managed Madonna. Yeah. <laughs> working at labels. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think, oh, the two of them were green. No, I wasn't green, but I wasn't one of the power buttons at that right. point. Mm -hmm. You know, Sid Bernstein, um, who, who ultimately who she, who she was managed by, you know, Freddie DeMann. He, those those guys were an inner sanctum, you know. That's when the president of, of Columbia calls up Freddie and says, "I got this really hot act. I want you on it," you know. Mm -hmm. And people of that ilk, managers of that level, they're order takers. They're not artist developers. Right. I was always and and aspire to be artist developers, and I like an artist developer, and I like people that want to do that. I I help Madonna become Madonna, and I help other mm -hmm. artists become other artists. Right. And the book talks about that. The book talks about how record labels have called me in to work with, with difficult artists mm -hmm. or work with artists that maybe one aspect of their life was, was not intact. You know, uh, Tim, Tim Collins, who managed uh, Aerosmith, mm -hmm. Aerosmith at one point was um, about to explode. They, mm -hmm. they were going to break up, you know, and I owned Longview Farm Studios at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, they're all... They're all Massachusetts, New Englanders up there. And <laughs> Tim said, I'd like to buy out the entire place for a week. I want to bring the band in. We have some meetings, right? So we had Aerosmith there for a week. And they had someone mediating the band. It was a coach. Back then, it wasn't called a coach. Right. Mm -hmm. But aired all the, the problems, you know, sat down with everybody, helped with communication, kind of like couples therapy, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it, it works beautifully. Mm -hmm. So the book delves into all that kind of stuff, but in a really unique way. It's a good read, really good mm -hmm. read. I can't wait for it. It sounds like a really exciting book. What, one of the things you mentioned, so I'm skipping to one of my later questions, um, was about how you handle situations. So I saw this old interview where the interviewer asked you about how you felt about not being part of the winning end of Managing Madonna, and your response was amazing. Um, your response was that you were on the win winning end because your goal was to discover, manage, and develop a superstar, which you did. Uh, and it's such a positive, optimistic mindset. Where does that come from? Well, first off, there's always a mourning period when you lose something, okay? And mm -hmm. this was my dream, okay? Mm -hmm. At 18 years old, I sat in front of the dinner table with my mom and dad. I just got my job at Columbia. I was, I was a little older than that. I was 20. I just had gotten my job at Columbia Records. Mm -hmm. And my father's, I was spouting about everything about you know, artist manager, da, da, da. and I said, I want to manage the biggest star in the world someday. Mm -hmm. I said it at 20 years old. And my father looked at me, nice Italian guy, ex, he, he was a cop, you know, but I mean, it was an era where women didn't do what I was doing, you know. Mm -hmm. He looked at me, he said, stop talking stupid, okay, do your job, find a man, get married, have kids. Down the, down the era when I did finally manage Madonna, he did apologize. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the, the, yeah, you know, did I want to go through that whole process with Madonna? And do I think that there were the, some of the missteps that I've seen could have been avoided? Of course, you know, mm -hmm. have I on occasion armchair quarterbacked her career? Of course I do. Mm -hmm. But you know what never leaves me is her best interest. Right. You know, I hate when they get slammed like that. Yeah. You know, I, it, Bob Lefferts, and I really enjoy his his newsletter. I really yeah. do. It, you know, he'll he'll dis he'll dis women kind of from a, from an ageist point of view, mm -hmm. and then in that same conversation, he won't dis Mick Jagger. He'll talk about you know the, the Rolling Stones still have you know a sizzling right. bass line and stuff yeah. like that. That you know. That to me, because I had the Madonna Center situation, that gave me a platform to make some changes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, I did get, uh, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I got the best of the situation mm -hmm. after my mourning period. <laughs> uh, where where I, I was, it took a little while for me to be recognized. 
right. because there were because of the, the lawsuit and the settlement and all everybody was kind of afraid mm -hmm. to 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 be nice to me because they would have had a dis Madonna at that right. point in time and and, and the, this is a this is indicative of the industry people will go where the power is it doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether the power is right or wrong but they'll mm -hmm. go to it and you know and they don't want to be on the wrong side of power. So I had to wait a little while, I kind of, you know, because I got into a fight with Madonna, you know, and Alan Grub, you know, it was Grubin and Andersky, like the, the ultimate lawyer of the stars, right? Um, people kind of laid low for a while. But then Christopher Anderson's book came out mm -hmm. and Anderson lays her success at my feet and says, there wouldn't be a Madonna, there wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for this woman that put her on the right track, got her the great musicians, because I did. I mean, I turned around to the bass player of David Bowie, um, the, the keyboard player of, of uh, and, and composer for Phil Collins, you mm. know? I, I mean, amazing people I put together yeah. because I had them from the studio. She right. never worked with, with, with really amazing performers like that. Mm. And she clicked the minute, the minute she got all of the, the tools she needed, mm. you know? So I got the best of it. I completely got the best. Yeah. It, and, you know, and, and my career continued to take off. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, call Camille, she'll know how to handle this artist. Right. Call Camille, she'll know how to do this. And I had a great, I, you know, I continue to have a great career. Mm -hmm. And having epics like that and being, you know, even after your morning period, like, of course, everyone's allowed to have that, but you still came out a positive, optimistic, powerful person. And people want to work with people like that in the long term. Because like you said, you can call anyone that you've ever worked with and they know who you are and they trust you. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that in and of itself was worth the investment of my time, effort and energy. And you can say everything, maybe I would have won bigger if I was a bit more of a slime bucket, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm real content, you know, mm -hmm. with what I have. I, you know, I've, I've helped launch three very successful companies. I'm in the process of working with another organization that's New York and LA based. Um, they're going to do astronomical things and they're an amazing entertainment company and they're mm -hmm. amazingly financed. So they are going to kick ass and take names. I'm, mm -hmm. allowed, to, I'm allowed to say that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can't curse, right? You, yeah, as much as you want. <laughs> okay, good, good. So I, I, I still get those opportunities. You know, I, mm -hmm. I started coaching the CEO and I coach a lot of CEOs. And all of a sudden he said to me, would you, would you be up for doing more consultancies? And mm -hmm. I said, what do you have in mind? And he explained it to me. So now I'm helping to shape another company. Mm -hmm. That's such a gift yeah. you know, for someone Absolutely. like me. It's such a blessing to take everything that I've learned over three decades mm -hmm. and be able to apply it. But I will say this, and, I, and, and this goes back to my, my devotion and dedication to new people coming onto the scene. I am still learning and you continue to learn. Yep. Deal with always technology. A, always a student. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're always a student. You're a student until mm -hmm. you close your eyes for the last time. Yeah. You know? So now with technology, you know, we're dealing with technology now. We're dealing with the fact that the pandemic has pushed everything online. Right. How do we deal with, with uh, live performance? I've been working with a lot of artists and a lot of companies to help adapt to what's going on here mm -hmm. and, 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 and exist and survive, you know? Right. It, it, it's, it's extraordinary to have that stimulation in your life. And I'm very, I'm very thankful and grateful for the opportunities that I get, mm -hmm. you know? Speaking of your writing, you have a blog on Medium, and one of your articles on there, I think it's your first article, is do artists really still need a record deal? Mm -hmm. So I have two questions on, on that article. The first one is um, artist development doesn't really happen that much on a label level anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It really happens really at the artist level, and maybe some management companies uh, will participate in the artist development process. Um, if there's an artist that's just set on being on a label and getting a label's attention, do you have any... I guess guidelines of things they can work towards so specific number of tickets they sell at this many markets or venues uh this many subscribers on their email list or this many streams or views like what are some tangible things that artists can kind of work towards and set goals towards to get a label's attention sure sure first let me preface the, the answer by saying the majority of the labels right now are offering 360 deals Mm -hmm. For anyone does it, that doesn't know what that means, it means that the labels are actually making a piece of, of the action for not only music sales, live performance, maybe publishing, maybe sponsorships, endorsements, whatever's going on. The whole, the whole premise for selling that to the, to the record industry was 
labels were supposed to do more artist development. Right. They were supposed to hire people in those areas to help develop those streams of income. Mm -hmm. Sadly, that never happened. Right. And your comment of their labels aren't doing artist development mm -hmm. is true. Right. Artist development really falls under the, the, the auspices of, a, of management and the artists themselves. Mm -hmm. And the artists themselves started out. In order mm -hmm. to attract a manager, you, you better have a little something going on. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Now, when social media first started to like take the stranglehold over the music industry that it mm -hmm. did, uh, the labels immediately reverted to, okay, we're going to create a formula. How many followers do you have to have? How many reviews do you have to have? Mm -hmm. It became mathematical. Right. When I started out in the business, AR people went out to clubs. They came back. I'm floored by the <laughs> by this band, you know, and, and you're you're in the vice president of A&R's office and you're literally almost jumping on his desk. You gotta sign this guy. Mm -hmm. There was passion. People use their ears. It mm -hmm. wasn't mathematical, you know. So for, for today's artist that wants to draw attention, you need to be a great performer and people need to know about it. Whether right. you do that online now or you do it in clubs, you need to get reviews. Mm -hmm. um, you you need to have social media following because it it's really your core audience. It's yeah. the equivalent of being able to do a ten city tour in two hundred seater clubs and selling out. Right. You know, and that that is what really needs to be done before anyone in the industry is even going to look at you. Yep. But I'm happy to report that now more than ever, I'm seeing labels take some risks. Mm -hmm. Social media numbers aren't that good, you know? Um, they're really not gigging, but boy, I saw this act perform and they blew me away. Mm -hmm. They need to be more confident about their ears. The yeah. music industry in the early days was actually a filter mm -hmm. and only certain things got through. You know, I, sometimes I hear myself saying things that I heard my mother say, mm -hmm. the music of today isn't the way it used <laughs> to be, you know? And I'm saying to myself, is that true? Mm -hmm. And to an extent it is. Hmm. To an extent, okay? So now we don't have that filter. We don't have the music industry like, like a colander where the, the pasta comes in and the water comes out the bottom. Mm -hmm. the, the, the internet just lets everything go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we have is we have a, you know, it's, it's 50,000 miles long, but a quarter of an inch thick, mm -hmm. you know? So we have no filter. Mm -hmm. And sadly, 95, 98% of the stuff out there isn't really commercially viable for various reasons, okay? So what I think artists have to do is they have to get their social media thing together. I think they have to be very, very careful what they post online. Mm -hmm. I think you really have to have a high, high quality control level. Mm -hmm. Now more than ever, because everybody's online now. Oh, yeah. So now you're really competing with some very heavy duty work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's maybe more well-funded than you are. I don't think you need a major record deal immediately and i don't think it's it makes sense either yeah. because because of the let's throw the spaghetti up against the wall and see if it sticks <laughs> attitude and you'll probably be dropped so you need to have some motivation you need to have a manager or or a, a team behind you that that is decently funded that can help develop you mm -hmm. you know yeah. but i think there are also some really really good um indie indie deals small mm -hmm. record labels that are doing artist friendly deals that make sense. It's almost a la carte. You can pick the, the services. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not paying you know, astronomical uh, amounts for things. The royalty structure is different. They're giving support where support is necessary. And I think right. you can use that. I mean, Ed Sheeran was on an indie label for how long? Right, yeah. But you get to a point in your career, even with really great success, where you need the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're not getting the Super Bowl from an indie label. Right. You're not getting that major tour on Live Nation. You're not getting that Live Nation deal when they turn around and say, okay, we're gonna give you a hundred million dollars here and we're gonna put you on tour for the rest of your life. Even if you're dead, we're gonna put the coffin on the stage because right. we've got to recoup that money. The, the hologram. <laughs> right, the hologram is coming for it's Live coming. Nation, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because some of these artists, you know, they're not gonna perform anymore. Mm -hmm after COVID, you know, I, I, I have tickets. I'm, I'm a share fan. Okay. I have, tickets, awesome. I have tickets for share at the Amelie and of course mm -hmm. it canceled and now it's for September. I, I won't go, mm -hmm. you know, 
and and I don't want her to go. I don't want right. her to be on that stage with yeah. 40,000 people breathing on her, you know, because I don't <laughs> want to lose her and stuff. So so it, it's it's very important, you know, to to understand the labels have a function, mm -hmm. but you have to wait till those functions are are necessary for your career. Mm -hmm. And you can do a lot on your own or with a small artist development team. So I see a step system with regards to careers. You set goals at various points in your life mm -hmm. and you use the team that you need for that. Now, there's no disloyalty if you explain what your, what your strategy is. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I think artists really need to have to, to have the initiative. If they're not good at marketing, they need to talk to somebody that's a marketer. Right. You know, if they, need, you know, and you know, the gigging situation, I, I, it breaks my heart to even think about it because I have things that I want to say about live performance, but right now I don't even know if they're viable, you right. know, because mm -hmm. of what we have going on here. Um, I think you have to wait for a record deal with mm -hmm. a major. I don't think you have to wait for a, a nice designer deal, artist friendly. You know, I, I saw a lot of artists come through the, the Florida area through uh, listening room concerts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's a fabulous, fabulous medium. Mm -hmm. uh, not only from a picking up, you know, anchor dates and, and routing and, and maybe a little extra money, but that intimacy makes mm -hmm. for very loyal followers. Absolutely, and yeah. you have the ability to sell your merch and, and be one-on-one -on -one and, and all that kind of stuff. I think that was, it's brilliant, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that also serves to answer the, the dilemma of not having a lot of clubs to, to gig live in. Right. So, so I think um, reviews, I think performance, I, I, and, you know, reviews and, and performance relative to the internet right now, a, mm -hmm. a lot of views, um, I think write-ups, um, putting out good music, um, mm -hmm. maybe connecting with a, with a philanthropic organization mm -hmm. and, and, and getting your, your, putting your energy into service. I mm -hmm. think uh, all of those kinds, of, I think you have to write, if you're a songwriter, you have to write a lot of songs, not only for yourself, for your, but for other people, try and get mm -hmm. covers, try and get them into films. I think you really have to do a lot to bring attention to you. Mm -hmm. But it all has to be a at a very, very high level of quality in order for you to beat the odds. Right, yeah. So I'm mostly involved in like the DIY artist world. And there's some artists doing really amazing things in that world. I mean, Wolfpack is selling out uh, Madison Garden for uh, Madison Square Garden for, for three nights in a row. And they're a completely independent band. So I teach a lot in that world um, because there's so much artists can do and take control of their career. Sure. And I always say, look at everyone on the business teams with talking about taking steps. Everyone is a partner and there's a right time and a wrong time to bring on a partner. And there's the right kind of partner and the wrong kind of partner. So it's like making sure you have the right partner and the right deal before you um, take them on. But also the more value you build for yourself, the better of a deal you, you're going to get. Right. So the, yeah. Go, go, go. <laughs> and, and, and the thing that breaks my heart is I see artists spend so much time and money on creating that record that they always wanted to create or creating that music video they've always wanted to create, but then they have no money for marketing and advertising and PR. Um, I guess, what are some things that artists can do when it comes to doing like the, the marketing stuff and the advertising stuff that they can do independently? You, you have to be, you have to be so creative and so think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know if you're, you're aware of what, when ESPN first started doing all of the tennis stuff, they, they actually were the front runners in, in second screen technology. And I don't know if you know what that is. I'm, I'm sure you probably do. I, I think artists need to use the fact that we look at our phones 110 times a day, that even if I'm sitting there going to a concert, I'm still looking at my phone. And using that second, second screen technology is really a good marketing ploy right mm -hmm. now. I yep. think that's excellent. I think controversy, um, if, if constructively done, uh, helps with marketing mm -hmm. as well. Um, everybody is doing social media, everybody is, you know, that, and sometimes you maybe just need to go, go back to the basics, you know, mm -hmm. Occam's razor, you go to the simplest, thing. send out a really cool e-blast, you know, mm -hmm. with some links mm -hmm. and, and just keep, you know, this is, the, you know, the new artist newsletter, very basic stuff that you can do. Mm -hmm. I also think utilizing, uh, 
the loyalty of the younger generation is very important. I think mm -hmm. garnering you, you, you know, in the early music business, college radio was incredibly important, right. but it was also one of the fastest moving areas of radio because the, the glut of product was so great. Mm -hmm. But Billboard had their Heat Seeker, which was the, the song that got the most airplay in college radio, and that mm -hmm. was very important. I think utilizing that type of platform and, and, and honing your marketing in on a specific demographic is very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, I, and it's, you, you can't use that scatter principle. You mm -hmm. have to really understand who's going, who's most likely to buy into you as an artist. Right. So it's, I think it's a little bit more cerebral in terms mm -hmm. of the physical things you have to do. It's more strategizing to get you as close as you can to that market that's most likely to love you. Right. You mm -hmm. know, I think yeah. that's, that's very important. The other stuff is, is you know, it's, it's just the things you learn to do mm -hmm. with marketing. But I would dare to be as different as I possibly could. I, I, you know, uh, we, we had a, we had a band that, um, wanted a gig a, a, a few weeks ago. And of course they couldn't gig. And we came up with an idea of them renting a flatbed truck mm. and putting the band right on the back of the truck. That's awesome. <laughs> right. And just going into parking lots, you know, we, you know, the police shoo you away. That's even fun too. You know, <laughs> yeah. they were, well, I don't know. Now they'd feel okay about getting arrested, but <laughs> you know, then it was like, oh, maybe we'll get a little bit of a write-up, maybe something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of think outside the box. Yeah. You mm -hmm. gotta do things that are that are exciting, maybe a little bit, you know, different and yeah. dangerous. It's differentiation, yeah. you know. I love that. Because I mentioned uh Shep Gordon in the beginning. Right. He calls that creating moments of history. He's right. I I, I know Shep too, you know, yeah. and he's he's an icon, you know. There's mm -hmm. the, the He's, he's done it all in the music business. He really yeah. has. And yes, uh, creating history is really important. Mm -hmm. really important. Everyone starts with, with zero, right? With zero experience. And what advice would you give to an aspiring manager that hasn't really had the opportunity to, let's say they're working with an artist, they've done really well, they're really good at marketing, they're getting the label's attention, and now they have their first deal on the table. And they've never really negotiated or looked at a deal. Because I know that's one of the things you talk a lot about it. Artists should be working with people that have uh, negotiated 360 deals and know what's in the language and know how to mm -hmm. uh, maybe get more ownership of their masters and other parts of the deal. So if you haven't, if you're a manager that doesn't have experience with that, what can that person do to kind of, I guess, protect themselves and be better at, at the negotiating table? Uh, yeah, it, we, we rewind back. Education is what it is, experience. You have to have either a mentor or a teacher, or if you don't have one, you're gonna to have to rent a mentor or a teacher, you know? So is it, is it that entertainment attorney? Is that business coach that, that, that's done those types of things? Find someone that you can sit down with and help, have them help you, all right? You don't go blindly into that, you right. can't. You need to understand every clause in that contract. And so many times I hear, but that's what a lawyer does. Right. No, that the lawyer negotiates your deal, okay? Your job as a manager is to make sure that that record label and that artist are adhering to that contract. So you better understand that. Yep, mm, that's good. You know? mm. I was dealing with an artist just recently that got dropped from um, Def Jam. Mm -hmm. And he said, they just dropped me. Don't they have to pay me? I said, well, what does your contract say? Right. I don't know. Oh, wow. I said, all right, let's schedule a session. Send me over your management, send me over your record deal. Let me see if there's any, anything in there mm -hmm. that says there's a, there's a payer, it's a payer play clause. Right. So mm -hmm. I explain what that was and all that. It gets me the contract. I read it. There is a payer play clause in there, but it says if artist has completed all his or her material obligation. Mm, mm. I say, so go back to him. I said, have you completed your material obligations? What are those? He <laughs> says to me, oh, I said, oh, we got to review your entire contract, you know, yeah. and there are, there are built ins in every contract that the things you have to do as an artist, if you don't do it, then you're not adhering to their co the, the contract. So why should they adhere to your contract? Yeah. You know, so it, it's, it's all about 
understanding the language. You know, you go to, it's like going to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. You better understand the language or you're not eating, you're not finding a place to live. You can't get from place to place. It's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So you got to get help. You mm -hmm. can't wing it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because you, you, they're locking an artist up for five years. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. or, or, or five deals, or five records, let, let's put it. They're owning that artist. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned ownership of masters, okay? The whole Taylor Swift thing and all, tragic that that had mm -hmm. to come out like that and, and, yeah. and do that. And, and, you know, there was a point in her career where she was not doing very well. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the label was interested in dropping her. And she got backing from her dad and a bunch of other things. That was the moment to renegotiate that point, the deal. Right. Now, because they would have gladly, easily said yes to, look, let's do it this way. If she sells 3 million units, you, that agreement that you own those masters turns into a lease. Mm -hmm. And if she leaves, those masters go with us. Mm -hmm. Really easy to do. Yeah. They would have said, sure, this kid's never gonna do 3 million units, right? She does 3 million units, she's free, da -da, it's done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to think ahead. Mm -hmm. You've got to think mm -hmm. of okay. ultimate success and ultimate failure, and you have to plan for both. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if you don't know how contracts work, you can't do that. Yeah. In, in one of your articles, you also mentioned that the manager is like the anchor of the artist development team. So mm -hmm. that's so true. As a person that is the anchor, they should maybe even be looking at some of the same coaching programs that artists that are being offered to artists. And there's some great ones out there, like your program. Uh, I've had Rick Barker on the podcast who used to manage Taylor Swift. Uh, Wendy Rick, Day is, from, Rick, Rick really says good things. He, he really does. does. Yeah. yeah, and then there's Wendy Day from Rap Coalition who does some amazing things. Ari, like some younger coaches are coming out, like Ari Herstan, Entrepreneur. Is maybe coaching a good place to start with your artist development team? And how do you know who the right coach is? Because there's so many different styles of coaches. Some are more focused on digital marketing, more on labels. Right. I, I think, yes. I think I, I build myself as, as a business coach, but I specialize in, in, in entertainment and specifically the music business, right? So I, I, it, it's a great um, stand-in mm -hmm. to begin that music, the, the, the music artist development team. Okay, mm -hmm. do you need a manager? Are you ready for a manager? But at the same time, you know, I believe in really educating the artist himself so, uh, or herself. So what I try and do is I say, do you want to go over contracts? You want to sign a manager? You want to sign with a manager? I said, all right, let's sit down and let's look at a management contract. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about the type of manager you need. But let me show you what a manager does because you're going to have to interview that person. Okay. It's not, he loves my music. That's not enough. <laughs> He's my aunt's brother. Not enough. You know, you better know what's going on with the music business. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to learn, then you set up maybe a co-management situation. Or something, mm -hmm. You know, but I think it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative mm -hmm. that um, the, the artist development team is, is structured properly. And I think coaching is a great interim way of going into that. There's also an, an, an extra added appeal to it. You don't have to sign a, a long-term commitment. Right. You know, uh, my, my average coaching time is between three and six months with people meeting once a week. Mm -hmm. You know, and they meet with me for about an hour and 15 minutes and their handouts and I send them information awesome. that they need, but they have access to me via email and, and text all the time. And they get mm -hmm. one call a week if anything's mm -hmm. going on. And if they have a call anytime, if there's an emergency, mm -hmm. an emergency is I just got a call from Sony. They want to sign me. <laughs> That's an emergency. Yeah, a nice absolutely. emergency. Nice you know? emergency. <laughs> yeah. But a coach is, is a, a great interim. It's a, it's a great bridge mm -hmm. uh, to get it, to get you to the next level. And I think it's starting to catch on more and more. Yeah. And, and that's people, really great you know, you know, people like Scott, all those people that are in there, a lot of people in my era, uh, some of them are doing, doing uh, coaching in very specific areas. I know some radio promotion guys. That's a little tricky because now we're dealing with playlist curation. We're not dealing right. with promotion at radio the way we used to. But I think, there are enough people out there that can help you mm -hmm. without you having to sign a long-term agreement with them. And it's, it's worth the investment. You know, I always talk to, to, to the kids at school. I'd really like to coach with you, but I can't afford it. And I, and I usually ask them what kind of instrument they play. And they usually mm -hmm. tell me, or 
or if they're an engineer or something like that. And I said, do you have a lot of gear? And they say, yeah. And I said, well, how much did the guitar cost? <laughs> how much did the amp cost? I said, if that amp breaks, you have to fix it or you have to replace it. Investments in your career? Yeah. Coaching's a great investment in your Absolutely. career. Uh, the, 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 the average, the national average in terms of return on investment is like nine times what you pay for a coach. Mm -hmm. You usually get back. If you have a good coach, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But it's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful alternative now that, that wasn't available to a lot of, a lot of people in the arts, you know, a few years back, even as, as little as five or eight years back. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? I think I was one of the first artist, the first artist, artist oriented or arts oriented coach out there. I knew I needed to have a pretty broad scope of business, which is why I have an MBA, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but but generally, my experience in the music business and that MBA is is absolutely invaluable. Yeah, definitely. You you also also often talk about how you're a perpetual student. You're always learning new things. What are some areas that you're currently really interested in that you want to learn more about? It, it, uh, performing rights and and uh, the. Uh, online collection. I've been doing a lot of webinars and seminars. You know, these, these kids don't even know the codes they need to have on their music to be assured that they're going to be paid. That's why we have huge black box royalty accounts all over the world, you mm -hmm. know? So I think I have to keep up with that kind of information because we know now we've got TikTok. We're going to have something beyond TikTok. We right. have to make sure that, uh, the industry aligns with the new technology. And I think that's what I'm having to, to continuously learn, mm -hmm. you know, also the way the deals are structured now are different right. because it, it moved online. You know, the, there was a time when you had tangible product, when you had a CD mm -hmm. or, and now we have a little bit more vinyl. It, it, the entire payment structure for a record deal was based upon a base royalty rate mm -hmm. and all the ancillary incomes or percentages of that rate. Mm -hmm. One of them being online sales, uh, sync licensing, meaning, you know, film and TV, but they were just a fraction of that base rate. It's flip flop now. Mm -hmm. So the older artists that have older record deals needed to re renegotiate those things. And the newer artists now, we've got uh, entertainment lawyers that are compensating for that. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I think that's what I have to learn a lot about because it's going to continually change. I know a lot now and I think I'm up to date, right. you know, but something else is going to happen. The music True. modernization act, I'm still tearing that apart to understand yeah. it, you know, same. Um, and you, say, you too, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that's important. I think understanding now, you know, live performance, uh, you mentioned holograms a little mm -hmm. while ago. How do we work that? Yeah. I, I recently did a show. Done. I recently did a show. So I work for AG uh, right now. I'm a production okay. for them. Yeah. And I recently did a show that was a uh, Buddy Holly and Roy Orbison hologram show. Uh, phenomenal technology. It's and it's the show did really well. It was in Sarasota, Florida. It's so not far from you. Yeah. But yeah, that is an interesting. That is an interesting question. How do we now work holograms into into deals? You will. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's built in there, you know, technology now known or discovered in the future, it's in yeah. there. I yeah. mean, they've got it covered, you know, oh, yeah. they, they, they've got that language down, you know, <laughs> it used to be the world, now it's the universe, you know, no, the universe, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm wondering if the space shuttle is paying for ASCAP, BMI, and, and, and <laughs> because they're playing music up there, you yeah. know, it's copyright yeah. infringement if they're not paying. Yep. You know? and, and one day Elon Musk will be on Mars and <laughs> well, you know, I consult to one of the newer <laughs> performing rights agency, a great company called Royalty Genius. I, I'm going to ask them to see if they can maybe get that account. It would be great PR. You talk <laughs> about you talk about marketing. That's the kind of marketing you want to think about. Yeah. You know, I, I love the you know royalty genius. You know, licenses the you know the space station. You know, that would be fabulous. You know? <laughs> That's, awesome. That's funny. Uh, and then on the opposite end, from being a student as an educator, coach, mentor, what are some of the publications resources that you tend to share the most articles from? Uh, that's scary. <laughs> uh, you know, Rolling Stone has turned into a consumer magazine, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the special issues. They, they've come up with a format that enables them to survive and I think it's wonderful. Billboard is, you know, okay. I think some of the, the tip sheets, I mentioned Bob's, Bob Lefferts and a few, a few of the, 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 uh, the, the, I guess the reports, the music reports 
um, that are composed and, and uh, authored by music executives, I think, give you more information. I don't know that there are a lot of consumer magazines and the likes that aren't really giving the true story. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, I, I, it harkens back. I think you need a mentor. I think you need to know somebody that's in the game. I mm -hmm. think an internship is going to be much more valuable than reading tons and tons and tons of articles. Yeah. You know, you go online, you try going online just to figure out how to get your royalties off, you know, from, from streaming. Mm -hmm. There's 10 different articles and they all say something <laughs> different yeah. or they use different terms. Mm -hmm. And it's all very confusing to people. And they don't know what's going on. And one of my quests is to clarify that kind of stuff. So I, I think find, doing an internship with a company that's really doing work in the music business is, is the best way to work and learn. Um, but we, you know, I think you have an obligation to read Billboard. You know, you have an obligation to read some of the, 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 uh, the, the FM reports, you know, the, the radio reports and all that kind of stuff. I think it's very, very important. I think podcasts now are taking on a lot of yeah. the responsibilities of, of uh, industry trade papers. Yeah, a lot of good ones you out know? there. So I think a really reputable podcast is, is you, it's a must listen, a must see yeah. if it's mm -hmm. a web. You know, I think that really helps a lot now. But again, know the source, make sure it's good, make sure it's reputable. There's a great book called uh, The Death of Why. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the fact that kids go on the internet, they do their homework, they see the first thing, they write it down, you know, and it's bogus. Mm -hmm. You have to know where this information comes from. The right. fact that it's, it's available doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to do your homework. So true. Yeah. So I know we're quickly running out of time. I'll probably talk to you for another two hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to get a few, at the end, I have a few rapid fire like quick questions oh. uh, that I call getting to know. So some of you those can get in. What is uh, the most common bad advice you hear giving in our industry or advice that you hear people give that just makes you cringe? Um, hold on to your copyrights. Mm -hmm. Don't sell your publishing. <laughs> that's, that's one. You got to give to get, you know, yeah. you're, 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 you're coming out there and Beyonce wants to do one of your songs, but she wants all your publishing. If you get your name on it, do it. You yeah. know, that's one of them. I think you have to, you have to take a break and use it. Mm -hmm. So that's one. That's such a good, good one. And when you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Um, it's interesting. I'd say Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. like uh, and tell me about your first concert that you've been to, our first memorable concert experience. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's great. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, it, it, I, I went to concerts before. It, again, I was young when I joined Columbia. I was just mm -hmm. a kid. I was 20 years old, right? So how many concerts do you go to? I was too young for Woodstock. I couldn't do Woodstock, you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, the very first week that I worked for Columbia Records, my boss said to me, here's your backstage pass. See you at the garden, right? Oh, wow. It was Earth, Wind, and Fire opening uh, up nice. for Sly Stone. Ooh. I love it. Done. <laughs> I was done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was so hooked into the business. It was the most amazing thing. And, and I had this backstage pass. So I, you know, I went backstage and all of a sudden I was like, there's Sly over there. There's the Earth, Wind & Fire guys. Maurice is sitting right over there and all this kind of stuff. It impressed me beyond belief, not only because of me being there, but because it was such outstanding music. Yeah, such an yeah. amazing show. Such That's an awesome. amazing show. And, and since that, I, you know, I've seen so many amazing shows. Mm -hmm. And I love them all. <laughs> Same. What is something that you're currently really into, like interested in that has nothing to do with music business? It could be an app, a TV show, exercise, food. What? Uh, with, with the pandemic and eating too many Pringles, um, <laughs> uh, my, my, my wife and I are going on keto diet. Okay. We've done it before and it's very successful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was very, so it's, it's time to get rid of the pandemic pounds. Uh, so I'm excited about doing that and getting, getting healthier. You know, we, we're, I've, I've always worked from home, so I have the ability of, of doing exercise and, and that kind of stuff. So I, th I think, I, I think that's what I'm getting into right now is making myself healthier and my immune system and all those kinds of things. They're calling that the, the COVID-15 instead of the freshman 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that wasn't very neat, but that's, on, it's honestly what, what I'm interested in putting some time and attention in. Got, I just bought a bike, you know, going to do some biking. We have friends that do long distance biking, mm -hmm. uh, which I might consider. There's a, 
there's an AIDS ride that they do every year from St. Petersburg to Key West. Oh, which awesome. Is, is something that I, I, I'm considering training for and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That sounds fun. Two, two yeah. of my favorite places, St. Pete and Key West. Yeah. Key West is where I went for my honeymoon. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. nice. What are the, the books, documentaries, or podcasts you share or recommend the most? Um, you, you know, books um, in the business or in general? In general. Okay. There's a wonderful book called The Untethered Soul. Mm. And it's written by Michael Singer. I wonder if I have it right here. And, I, I have a really, <laughs> and, and what it talks about is that inner voice. Mm-hmm. And I think for artists especially, it's really important to understand and control that inner voice. You know, when an artist comes to you and says, I can't write a song, there's something going on. Who told you that? You know, you could write a, blog, you could write a song a week ago. So I think, <laughs> I think control of, of that is, is it, and that book really touched me because it, it, it gives you chan- tangible ways of fixing it. Now, yeah. Sometimes I practice it better than, than other days, you know, but it's there. And, right. and I think that's one I really like right now. And what is the best advice you've ever gotten? Uh, the best advice I've ever gotten. Um, find a solution. I love it. <laughs> and then what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Uh, I, I, I want to say find a solution, but that's not true. <laughs> uh, uh, To, uh, to, to not take things personally. Mm, that's a good one. And then what, what is something that you'd like to see change about the music industry? Um, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see more guttural love of music be decision-making mm. than, than, than numbers and, and metrics, you know? Mm-hmm. And when, when you hear that like 10% just bought a lot of, universal and stuff i worry about that i i i I worry when it becomes a big corporation Mm -hmm. because then it's corporate numbers and it has nothing to do with artistic taste and what are the people going to like i was so blessed to be involved in the music business when the love of music was the motivation Mm -hmm. you know i would like to see more of that and before i ask you the the last question i ask everyone uh what's the best place where people can learn about what you do and where they can get coaching from from you i have a website Mm -hmm. simple www.camillebarbone.com. I have a fi- uh, Instagram account. I have a Facebook page. Um, I, you know, that's that's the best place. Awesome. And you know, I had like I just uh, did a, a watermark article. I, I write, so you'll you'll find my bylines in places and stuff too. Awesome. You know? I'll I'll share that in the show notes and everything we've talked about today. I'll share all that in the show notes too. And then mm-hmm. before I ask you the last question. I just want to thank you so much for, for your time today and for being on the show and for sharing and also just, I guess, being an ethical person yeah. and teaching about that, about the music business and that the, the, the good people can win and be successful. Mm-hmm. And um, just for how much you give back to the music industry. It's just so amazing. I really enjoyed learning about you and, and talking to you today. So thanks so much. For thank that. you. I really enjoyed it too. I, I could talk to you for hours actually. <laughs> awesome. Good. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do a round two when the book comes sure, out. Sure. We'd love to. Love and to. Then, and the question I asked at the end is, what is your definition of making it? Um, I think uh, making it. Um, I, I think realizing your dream is, is my definition of making it. You know, I, I wanted to be in the music business. Uh, my cousin was an engineer uh, before I even knew about the, the music industry. And I went to the studio and I hung out for a little while and I saw what he did. And it, it became my dream. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and when I achieved that dream, I felt like I made it. And there were some times where I didn't, like, I was so afraid somebody was going to say, you, you don't really belong here. Get out. You know, because it was just so much my dream, you know. So I think making it has to do with realizing your dream. Uh, you know, your dream may be that you want $5 million in the bank. Then you better find a way to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 it could be financial. It could be, it could be intrinsic or extrinsic. Let's put it that way. You know, but it's fulfilling that moment that makes me feel like I made it. 